Good morning. Welcome to NTD. Good morning here. Today's top stories. President Biden teaming up with leaders of Japan and the Philippines to send a blunt message to China. That's as the Chinese Communist regime's aggressive actions risk escalation and a potential U.S. response in the South China Sea. House Republicans negotiating behind closed doors about renewing a powerful surveillance authority under FISA. What's next for the program that's dividing the GOP? Luis Martinez on Capitol Hill. Israel says it's on high alert for a possible attack by Iran and why the U.S. issued an immediate order to all government employees in Israel. Officials say Russian hackers stole U.S. government emails with Microsoft after accessing the tech giant's servers. More on the breach, forcing multiple U.S. agencies to shore up defenses. Twisters, torrential rains and washed out roads. The southeast hit with multiple storms. Video footage of the tempests wreaking havoc. Love soccer? The 2026 FIFA World Cup coming to the New York metropolitan area. Our exclusive report revealing the economic impact of arguably sport's biggest event at the MetLife Stadium. This is NTD Good Morning. Live from our global headquarters, here are Evelyn Lee and Kevin Hogan. Welcome to NTD. Welcome everyone and happy Friday. Today is April 12th. Weekend's right around the corner and experts at the Quincy Institute are warning that if too much emphasis in the trilateral meeting is placed on military deterrence instead of diplomacy, that may escalate tensions because China will just view it as a threat. Right, so we're heading into some more important news first. Some of the analysts actually say that those three-way partnerships are a move away from U.S.'s old way of operating with those bilateral agreements. Yeah, we see that back in 2022 with the U.S., South Korea, and Japan teaming up, and then also the AUKUS deal with the U.K. and Australia in 2021. Mm-hmm. Right, so probably you are able to guess what, are, what is topping our news this morning. Three nations in lockstep to counter Beijing. That's the message President Biden is trying to send as he meets with leaders of Japan and the Philippines at the White House. And today's White House correspondent Iris Tao has more on yesterday's summit. A new era of partnership. That's what President Biden tells as he holds the first ever trilateral meeting with the leaders of Japan and the Philippines. The three leaders vowing to deepen maritime and security ties with the goal to build an Indo-Pacific that is free, open, prosperous, and secure for all. The Biden administration says Thursday's meeting is focused on security in the South China Sea, a disputed waterway where Chinese Coast Guard ships have been ramming Philippine vessels and blasting them with water cannons. At the meeting, President Biden reaffirming the mutual defense treaty with the Philippines, which would require the U.S. to respond to an armed attack on the ally. The United States defense commitments to Japan and to the Philippines are ironclad. Any attack on Philippine aircraft, vessels, or armed forces in the South China Sea would invoke our mutual defense treaty. As Biden assures allies of U.S. backing in the face of Chinese aggression, the Japanese leader addressing a joint session of Congress on Thursday warned U.S. lawmakers about an unprecedented challenge from Beijing. China's current external stance and military actions present unprecedented and the greatest strategic challenge, not only to the peace and security of Japan, but to the peace and stability of international community at large. And as part of an upcoming announcement, the three countries will ramp up their military and Coast Guard cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region. Reporting from the White House, Iris Tao, NTD News. Former President Trump said he wants to debate President Biden as soon as possible. Trump called for earlier and more debates in the lead up to November. Trump did not debate his challengers during the GOP primary race, but in recent weeks he offered to debate Biden, quote, anytime, anywhere, any place. Trump's top campaign advisors Thursday sent a letter to the Commission on Presidential Debates. It asked the commission to move up its proposed debates to ensure more Americans have a chance to see the candidates before voting. The letter said the first of two debates in 2020 had an anti-Trump moderator and asked for the 2024 debates to be, quote, 
truly fair and conducted impartially. Biden did not commit to debating Trump, but did not rule it out, saying last month it would depend on the former president's, quote, behavior. And for a preview of former President Trump's upcoming criminal trial in New York over allegedly falsifying business records, we hear from John Malcolm. He's the vice president of the Heritage Foundation's Institute for Constitutional Government and the director of the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. Good morning to you, John. Thanks for making the time today. Is there any chance that a last-minute effort by Trump will cause the trial to be delayed at this point? No, I don't think so. His lawyers have uh, pulled rabbits out of a hat before, but I don't think that's going to happen this time around. Judge Murchon, uh, it's pretty clear that this trial is going to begin on Monday. The Court of Appeals has rejected former President Trump's attempts to delay that. I don't think anything's going to change between now and Monday. Yeah, that would be a long shot if so. And this will be the first criminal trial of a former president in United States history if it does go through. What are the defense team's opening arguments going to be here? Oh, I think that they're going to argue that this is an overtly political prosecution being brought by a prosecutor who ran for election uh, by saying that he was going to get Donald Trump if he was successful. Uh, this case involves uh, false business records. Usually that might result in some kind of a civil fine, at worst a misdemeanor. Uh, and Alvin Bragg has managed to uh, take these bookkeeping uh, errors and convert them into 34 felony counts, uh, which is remarkable. John, can you please explain how the appeals process over the gag order can play out while the trial simultaneously proceeds? Well, I, it's a very, very broad gag order. So, for example, President Trump has been, uh, former President Trump has been told that he can't comment on family members of the judge, which at first blush sounds great. But what he was trying to point out is that Judge Murchon's daughter has and continues to do extensive business with Democrats, including Kamala Harris, who have criticized Donald Trump. He's not doing that to go after the daughter. The daughter is a free person who can work for whoever she wants. He is suggesting, though, that the judge, because of his daughter's relationship, is biased against him. I think that should be fair game. Certainly, there are a lot of people out there criticizing uh, former President Trump, and he has been prevented from providing a robust uh, defense, at least in the court of public opinion. Understood. And John, in your view, were the appeals court decisions fair, including one not to delay the trial while Trump sought to change the venue out of Manhattan? Well, I think if he had brought these motions earlier, there's a decent chance that they might have been granted. It's going to be difficult for him to get a fair trial in Manhattan, where he's well known and not very popular. But I think the Court of Appeals said, well, you filed these things very late, uh, and it seems as if the reason you filed them is to get a last minute delay, and they weren't going to put up with that. I see, John. It seems that the potential jurors were basically asked everything relevant, even if they went to a Trump rally, except what political party they were in and which presidential candidate they voted for. Is that good practice? Well, I think it's a necessary practice here. Uh, there's going to be nobody who appears in that courtroom who hasn't heard of Donald Trump or who doesn't have a viewpoint one way or the other. Who you vote for or what political party you belong to is considered to be sort of almost a privacy interest, certainly a core First Amendment right. Uh, but certainly asking questions about what do you think about Donald Trump? Do you have any views about the, the merits of this case or any other thing that Donald Trump has done? Uh, trying to come up with 12 jurors and six alternates who are prepared to be impartial in terms of evaluating the evidence is going to be a very difficult and time-consuming thing to do. And you have to ask a broad range of questions in order to try to root out bias. So I'm not surprised that that's going to happen here. And former President Trump has cast this as election interference. And keep in mind that if the trial is not delayed, he's going to be in a courtroom four days a week while President Biden is out campaigning. John Malcolm, vice president of the Heritage Foundation's Institute for Constitutional Government and the director of the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies, thank you for weighing in this morning. Good to be with you. Former President Trump is trending upward in election polls. <clears throat> in multi-candidate races in all swing states, he leads President Biden by between two to seven points. And today's Daniel Monahan has more on the latest numbers, plus analysis from a polling expert. Former President Trump's swing state lead is based on January to March poll averages of registered or likely voters listed by 538. When excluding third party candidates, President Trump stays ahead of his opponent. But experts say there are some factors the polls may not reflect. Trafalgar Group's head pollster Robert Cahaley had the most accurate results, showing a Trump victory in 2016. 
He says Trump's hidden voters are one such factor. Trump's hidden voters are people who just won't say they're for Trump. He says the share is a bit smaller this year, and part of the hidden Trump vote is already reflected in the polls. Other sources of Trump's lead include more support from black, Latino, and young voters. Professor David Taylor, director of the Institute for Policy and Opinion Research at Virginia's Roanoke College, says a small lead doesn't always translate into victory. If someone has a 10-point lead, they're likely to win. If someone has a three-point lead, you're cautious. If you have a one-point lead, that's really a tie. Taylor also cautions voters from relying too much on single polls. There are five polls. Don't look at any one poll. Average them together, and that's going to give you the best sense of what the most likely outcome is, given all the information we have. Taylor says at the end of the day, a poll is just a snapshot of the demographic someone looked at at that point in time. It's the best guess, but, you know, if uh, something happens on the Saturday before the election where that might change people's opinions and votes, no poll is going to be able to capture that unless it starts Saturday or after. The polling expert adds that a rare event can change everything in an instant. The polls could still say someone's ahead by six, but they could lose by eight because of things like, you know, right now it's sunny, but... Uh, a tornado could appear in five minutes. Another important factor is voter turnout. Trafalgar Group's Robert Cahaley says Democrats are very good at getting people who really don't care about voting to turn out to vote. The pollster says it's pretty hard to poll somebody who was never planning to vote. On third-party candidates, Cahaley expects Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s candidacy to play a big role in this year's election. On average, Kennedy commands 10% of registered or likely voters in swing states. Kennedy is now only officially on the ballot in Utah, but his campaign says it has enough signatures for Hawaii, Idaho, Nevada, New Hampshire, and North Carolina, and is working on qualifying in other states. Kahaley believes that Kennedy has the resources to get on the ballot in most states, a move which could have a dramatic effect on results in November. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. House Republican leaders are negotiating a compromise to renew controversial government spy powers that expire on April 19. Our Washington correspondent Luis Martinez has the details on this fourth attempt to renew the surveillance program. Speaker of the House Mike Johnson remains hopeful he can convince his House Republican colleagues to reach a consensus and reauthorize the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. There, there's some differences of opinion, but um, I think everyone, most everyone understands the necessity of getting this right and getting it done. And so we're going to try to find a path to do that. House Republican leaders are trying to balance the need to maintain a surveillance tool that has helped thwart terrorist attacks and protect American civil liberties and privacy. House Democrats, on their end, have expressed a skepticism to Speaker Johnson's strategy. Uh, Speaker Johnson, who has signed up to essentially run a law firm that represents Donald Trump every day in Congress, uh, that means standing with Trump when it comes to national security means standing with terrorists. The idea that we would let this critical component of our security regime lapse would be the height of irresponsibility. Speaker Mike Johnson reportedly plans to reduce the FISA reauthorization to two years instead of five, thus promising House Republican an opportunity to amend the surveillance tool in case President Donald Trump wins the White House in 2024. I want to be able to vote on the amendment that stops these warrantless searches. And I believe we have the votes in the House to be able to pass this. FBI Director Christopher Wray warned lawmakers during a House Appropriations Subcommittee meeting of the perils of losing the powers of the FISA Act. Let me be clear, failure to reauthorize 702 or gutting it with some new kind of warrant requirement would be dangerous and put Americans lives at risk. House Republican leadership is planning on putting a new version of the FISA Reauthorization Act to a vote on the House floor as soon as this Friday. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. The Senate Judiciary Committee subpoenaed legal advocate Leonard Leo yesterday. It's part of an ethics probe into Supreme Court justices. The probe was started last year over alleged undisclosed travel and gifts to Justice Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito.
Senate Judiciary Chair Dick Durbin accuses Leo of playing a central role in what he called an ethics crisis that he says is plaguing the Supreme Court. Durbin says Leo has repeatedly stonewalled the committee. The committee says the subpoena is needed to better understand if undisclosed gifts were used to gain access to justices. Leo's attorney reacted in a letter to Durbin saying he will not comply. Leo, who served as an advisor to former President Trump, called the subpoena unlawful and politically motivated. Democrats would need Republican support to gain the 60 votes needed to enforce the subpoena if Leo defies it. Stay with us. Israel says it is preparing for an attack by Iran, and the U.S. issued an immediate order to all government personnel in Israel. The FBI director says it's crunch time with the growing threat of a terrorist attack on U.S. soil. The agency wants a surveillance tool renewed before it expires next week that it says helps protect against terror. Officials say Russian hackers stole U.S. government emails with Microsoft after accessing the tech giant's servers. More on the breach, forcing multiple U.S. agencies to shore up defenses when we come back. Welcome back. Israel's military says they are preparing for a possible attack from Iran. After a senior Iranian general and other military leaders were reportedly killed in an airstrike in Syria earlier this month, tensions in the region have been high. Here's more. Israel's military has not claimed responsibility for the deadly strike, but said it is highly prepared for a range of scenarios if Iran retaliates. An attack from Iran's territory will be solid proof of Iran's intention to escalate in the Middle East and stop hiding behind its proxies. IDF spokesman Daniel Hagari said Israel has been attacked by Iranian proxies from nearby countries for weeks, most prominently by the Houthis of Yemen and Hezbollah in Lebanon. He said while Israel's defense systems intercept most of these threats, the country is still on high alert. Israel's defense minister, Yoav Gallant, said that an Iranian attack on Israel would warrant an appropriate response. In a meeting with Gallant, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin assured Israel they could count on full U.S. support to defend against Iranian attacks. Meanwhile, the U.S. said Thursday it had restricted its employees in Israel and their families from personal travel outside big cities. The U.S. Embassy released a security alert citing an abundance of caution saying government personnel are authorized to travel only between Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, and Be'er Sheva. In an effort to avoid escalation in the region, Secretary of State Antony Blinken on Thursday met with Turkish, Chinese, and Saudi Arabian foreign ministers. The White House, meanwhile, said they were in communication with Iran. We communicated to Iran that the U.S. had no involvement uh, in the strike, as I just mentioned, uh, that happened in Damascus, and we warned Iran not to use uh, this attack as a pretext uh, to escalate further in the region or attack U.S. facilities or pers personnel. At the same time, the White House affirmed the U.S.'s ironclad commitment to Israel's security. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made strong comments about Iranian and other possible threats. He spoke to Israeli troops at an Air Force base on Thursday. And we established a simple principle. Whoever hurts us, we hurt him. On Thursday, the military said Israeli jets hit Hezbollah military targets in the areas of Lebanon. Netanyahu's statements come as Israel pulls its troops out of the Gaza Strip in preparation for an assault on the southern Gaza city of Rafah. So for more on the threat from Iran, we bring in Brendan Weikert. He's a geopolitical analyst and the author of The Shadow War, Iran's Quest for Supremacy. Good morning, Brendan. Good to see you as always. Now, not everyone believes that we're actually going to see a direct attack from Iran's territory at Israel. So what do you think? Well, I think that right now it could go either way. And I think what's going to be the key determinant is how um, weak or disconnected the American sig signals of support for Israel are. If Israel, th if Iran thinks that the U.S. under Biden does not have Israel's back, and it looks like, despite our, our rhetoric, we might not, then the Iranians will feel that it's okay to strike very hard, along with Hezbollah, against Israel, which could happen in the next 72 hours. Right. So nevertheless, Biden just announced his ironclad support. That's what he said. So what do you think he means by that then? Um, what would be the role that the U.S. would ultimately be willing to take on? 
I honestly don't even think Biden really knows what he means by that. I think this is all for show. Um, we know that immediately after the Israeli attack on the Iranian consulate in Syria, um, the Iranians beat their chests at the Israelis, but then quietly called the White House and begged Biden to please help them get Israel off their back. And immediately thereafter, the Biden administration began publicly chastising Israel, telling them to start drawing down the war. The Israelis have been drawing down their forces in Gaza, and yet the threats are still coming in from Iran. So that should tell your audience that the Iranians are are probably going to do something uh, because they don't think the Biden administration's support for Israel is really that ironclad. I see. So it doesn't sound like that message of deterrence really translates to Iran is what you mean. Um, so some analysts have said that Iran wants to save face. So what would that mean to Iran? How would they achieve that? Well, if they want to just save face, no matter what, I think we're going to see some kind of hostile action, either from Iran, uh, the Houthis, or Hezbollah. The question is the severity. Now, the intelligence community in the U.S. is saying that it's going to be a massive missile fusillade. Um, if that's the case, I don't know how the Israelis are just going to sit there and take it. They're going to strike back, especially if it's the kind of missile attack that the Iranians are talking about. Um, and we could even see this thing escalate very quickly. Uh, it could even go nuclear if things get really dicey. And we also have to remember that there are many Iranian agents operating in Europe and the United States undercover, and they may very well be preparing to do terrorist attacks if Tehran decides to actually attack Israel in the way U.S. intelligence fears. Right, would be very alarming developments. So what is Iran's capability um, if we compare it to Israel? Well, the Iranians have a very advanced missile, precision-guided, long-range missile capability, not just themselves, but they've given that capability to Hezbollah. We've seen also the Houthis with drones and long-range missiles. They, the Iranians, through their proxies, have the ability to encircle Israel with these missiles and drones and conduct really, really devastating attacks. There is even some concern that Hezbollah is planning to detonate the ammonium nitrate storage tanks in the port of Haifa, which would simulate a dirty bomb at blast, and that could basically knock out the port of Haifa as an economic hub for decades, which would be de debilitating to Israel's economy. And we know that Hezbollah and Iran have planned to conduct missile attacks on critical Israeli infrastructure, as well as cyber attacks, to basically drive the economy down in Israel and basically terrorize the civilians of Israel even more. I see. Well, let's all hope that it doesn't come to an escalation. Thank you so Indeed. much, Brendan Weikert. Thank you. Now, Israel says the level of aid entering the Gaza Strip has been at a record high. It's refuting allegations it was preventing humanitarian aid from crossing the border. The coordination of government activities in the territories or Kogad said they have seen record amounts of aid coming in over the past few days and there is no limit on the amount of aid they are prepared to distribute. At the same time, the IDF is dealing with another problem in the north. Here's the IDF's international spokesperson yesterday. We have a problem. We have a problem because Hamas, um, not only that Hamas started this horrible war and Hamas is hiding behind its civilians, Hamas is also looting as many humanitarian as many humanitarian aid convoys as they can. They're taking food coming into the people of Gaza for themselves. They're taking aid for themselves, and uh, that's a problem we, we we've been dealing. That's part of the situation in the north where we have opened Route 96 that gets faster and more directly to the north, so it takes down the chances of looting. Kogat said the content of 600 aid trucks is waiting to be collected by the United Nations on the Gaza side. It blamed the UN for creating bottlenecks that prevent the transfer of additional aid. FBI Director Christopher Wray is sounding the alarm about the possibility of a terrorist attack in the U.S. He says the FBI's concerns are growing about the threat of a coordinated attack similar to the ISIS attack at a Russian concert hall last month. Ray urged Congress yesterday to reauthorize Section 702 of FISA or the Foreign Intelligence, Intelligence, 
Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Section 702 is set to expire next week. Entity's Jeremy Sandberg tells us more. We've seen the threat from foreign terrorists rise to a whole nother level after October 7th. FBI Director Christopher Wray told the House Budget Panel Thursday that it was crunch time with Section 702 of FISA set to expire next week. I would be hard pressed to think of a time where so many threats to our public safety and national security were so elevated all at once. Ray pressed lawmakers to renew the surveillance program, calling it an indispensable tool to help prevent terror attacks. So let me be clear, failure to reauthorize 702 or gutting it with some new kind of warrant requirement would be dangerous and put Americans' lives at risk. A procedural vote for a bill to renew Section 702 failed in the House Wednesday. 702 allows the government to collect communications of non-Americans outside the country without a warrant, but it also allows the FBI to gather communications of Americans in the process, which has sparked some pushback from lawmakers. House Speaker Mike Johnson called the program critically important. Written testimony by Ray says the FBI had roughly 4,000 international terrorism investigations open at the end of the last fiscal year. The FBI director asked the panel to help get the Bureau's budget back on track after its 2024 budget fell $500 million short. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. The U.S. Cybersecurity Agency says Russian hackers have accessed Microsoft's servers to steal emails between officials and the tech giant. The watchdog put out an emergency directive this week requiring agencies to change any logins that were taken. It also requires them to check into what else might be at risk. The directive warns the hackers were exploiting authentication details shared by email to try and break into Microsoft's customer systems. Multiple government agencies were breached, but CISA did not name which ones. CISA did not describe the extent of any national security risks. It says the hackers might have gone after non-government groups too. And a confrontation at a UC Berkeley graduation dinner goes viral after protesters for Gaza disrupt the celebration at a dean's home. Twisters, torrential rains and washed out roads. The southeast hit with multiple storms. Video footage of the tempests wreaking havoc. Thanks for staying with us. Powerful storms sweeping across parts of the U.S. yesterday. More than 65 million people face the threat of severe weather. This comes just one day after much of the southeast was pummeled by strong winds and tornadoes. A door cam captured the moment a storm hit the town of St. Augustine yesterday, upending plants and lifting garden furniture. There's no crossing this washed out road. Two fierce storms hit Tallahassee, Florida on Wednesday and Thursday. The storms brought down more than 10 inches of rain, prompting flash floods and rescues of stranded people. In Louisiana, a tornado left a trail of destruction. Power lines snapped like twigs, a tangled mess of electric wires, tree branches and debris. The twister ripped roofs off of buildings and left tens of thousands without power. In North Carolina, a home security video captured a possible tornado moving through a neighborhood near Charlotte yesterday. A tree battered by ferocious winds can't hold on any longer. Its branches ripped off in the storm. By today, the bulk of the storms will have moved off, off the coast, but parts of the New England could see flooding. And a group of around 10 students from UC Berkeley protesting the war in Gaza disrupted a graduation, graduating dinner at the home of the school's dean this week. Video from a confrontation Tuesday is making its rounds on social media. The dean and his wife asked a student to leave multiple times and threatened to call the police after she took out a speaker and microphone. The student says the First Amendment protect, protects her conduct. She's now accusing the professor's wife of assaulting her for contact she made when trying to grab the microphone. The school's dean, Erwin Cherminsky, says she's deeply saddened students would use a social occasion at his home for a political agenda. He says the protesters tried to have other students boycott the dinner with protesters on campus and social media posts. 
The dean said the posters depicted him as a cartoon figure holding a bloody knife and fork. He said the caption read, No dinner with Zionist Shem while Gaza starts. He said the posters should be left up because of freedom of speech, even though many students and staff told him they made them feel unsafe. Here's Professor Sherminsky on the incident. We invited the graduating students over at the request of the class presidents to celebrate their graduation. And when a student took out of her backpack a microphone and an amplifier and began talking about what was going on in the Middle East, that's not okay in my home. No one was speaking that night. It wasn't in any way an occasion for anything but socializing and celebration. Now, the university's chancellor reacted in a statement that she was appalled and deeply disturbed by what happened. She said while the school's support for free speech is unwavering, it can't condone using a school a social occasion at a private residence as a platform for protest. She wrote, there is not a First Amendment right to use private property for speech. Also, controversy at another Planet Fitness gym. This time in North Carolina, a 38-year-old man who said he identified as a woman went into the women's locker room, according to police and 911 callers. He proceeded to remove all his clothes. A local channel reported that the man allegedly asked a 17-year-old girl to use lotion and shower together. Police arrested the man named Christopher Allen Miller for indecent exposure. Planet Fitness lets members use locker rooms and bathrooms based on how they say they identify. Planet Fitness says they're against any kind of harassment. Recently, there was controversy when a woman's membership got canceled. This after she told employees about a man who identifies as a woman shaving in the women's locker room and talked about it online. Nearly all abortions are banned in Arizona following the state's Supreme Court reinstating a ban. Why was this ban from the 1800s created in the first place? An author told me it involves brothels that doubled as abortion clinics back then. Here's my interview with Jason Jones, the president of the Human Rights Education and Relief Organization and the author of The Great Campaign Against the Great Reset. You know, I, I don't even like the way it's worded. It's, it's not that they're, quote unquote, banning all abortions, it's that they're protecting all children from the violence of abortion. And a lot of folks, you know, the, the Republicans are running for shelter. They're scared of kickback. But what they really should be celebrating the victory that they delivered to America, protecting the most vulnerable members of our family from violence. And this Arizona law, which they're trying to make as some sort of archaic relic of the past, um, really, it was the protection of children from the violence of abortion in the 19th century across the United States was driven by the American Medical Association. A lot of folks don't know that. These New England doctors of Puritan stock, as they moved west, they were scandalized to discover in towns across the western United States at the time and the territories that every town had a brothel and every brothel during the day was an abortion clinic. So the men went there at night um, and their wives went there during the day for abortions. The abortionists were the ones that, uh, the, the brothel owners were the ones that were the experts at performing abortions and uh, because their business, quote unquote, required abortion. So the initial law, this Arizona law was designed, driven by the medical establishment at the time to protect women from sexual exploitation and to protect women and children from the violence of abortion. Very, and in the very shocking revelations here. And that's just something that m many people might not know, diving back into history here. This law, like you mentioned, goes back to the Civil War era, and it was put back into place after Roe v. Wade was overturned at the help yep. of a Republican attorney general, and then blocked again involving a Democrat attorney general, and now the state Supreme Court has reinstated it. Give us a bigger picture of this background here. Yeah, well, let's look at it. Slavery, you look at the Democrat Party, the organizational principle of the Democrat Party for the first century of its founding was, was slavery. Uh, and then Jim Crow and segregation. The Democrat Party revolved around institutionalized racism. And now it revolves around its center principle. It's non negotiable principle went from slavery and then segregation and racism and then abortion. But in the 20th century, in the early 20th century, by people like Margaret Sanger, 
uh, a radical eugenicist and racist and the founder of Planned Parenthood, they were driving the abortion agenda and it was rooted in a racist agenda. So you look at the Republican Party was founded to end slavery. The Republican Party drove the campaign for civil rights and the Civil Rights Act for a century. And now for five decades, it's been through the Republican Party that Americans have worked to protect the child in the womb from the violence of abortion. Uh, it's, it's a tragic mistake that um, ambitious politicians are looking towards polls where they are now instead of looking to protecting really the most sacred principle in America, that our republic is founded on a vision of the human person, um, a vision of the human person as having an inviolable dignity, beauty, and worth, and that governments exist to protect human beings from violence, uh, especially the most vulnerable. And there's no one more vulnerable than the child in the womb. And something worth noting here is that President Biden is launching an over $1 million TV ad campaign trying to come in response to this and try to rally up his base. And that's hitting primetime, like Saturday Night Live and Grey's Anatomy. Jason Jones, president of the Human Rights Education and Relief Organization, thank you. Thank you for having me. Coming up, major U.S. airlines urging the Biden administration to pause additional flights between China and the United States. They cite the anti-competitive policies of the Chinese regime. Ride-sharing companies Lyft and Uber are planning to leave Minneapolis. Both companies are protesting a mandated driver pay raise, but the city council has taken action to stall their exits. Thanks for staying with us. We have NTD's Business Matters host, Don Ma, with us now to give us the latest updates from the business world. Good morning, Don. What's going on with air travel? Yeah, it seems like uh, some concern in that front. So major U.S. airlines and uh, aviation unions are urging the Biden administration to uh, sort of pause approvals uh, of additional flights between China and the United States. So they're citing ongoing anti-competitive policies mm -hmm. of the Chinese regime. Uh, so let me explain here. Airlines for America, uh, this is a trade group whose members include American Airlines, Delta Airlines, United Airlines, and unions. Uh, in a letter, the group called on the transportation and state departments to pause additional flights between the U.S. and China until U.S. workers uh, and businesses as well are guaranteed equality of access in the marketplace. So what that means is that, uh, so in, in February, the U.S. Transportation Department said Chinese passenger airlines could boost weekly round trip U.S. flights to 50 starting on March 31st, uh, up from the current 35 flights. So yeah, uh, seems like uh, airlines are concerned that uh, you know, th these policies are not in uh, the U.S.'s favor. Right, because as you said, um, China closed its markets to U.S. carriers at the start of the pandem pandemic, I believe that was, and it's still affecting the Americans. So um, let's talk about airline safety, especially with all the recent incidents with Boeing. What can you tell us there? Yeah, it seems like Boeing just can't uh, shake the limelight here recently. Yeah. Uh, the U.S. Senate Commerce Committee said yesterday it's going to hold a hearing next week with members of an expert panel. And this panel uh, released a report in February criticizing Boeing's safety culture and calling for significant improvements. Uh, so the FAA in February ordered Boeing to address systemic quality control issues within 90 days uh, after an audit found fault with the company's manufacturing process. A different Senate panel will hear a testimony from uh, starting next Wednesday from a Boeing whistleblower who claims Boeing dismissed safety and quality concerns, uh, and that is in the production of 787 and 777 mm. jets. Very serious stuff here, especially considering a report says that the Boeing whistleblower says that those 787 Dreamliners can break apart due to structural issues here. Let's talk about housing. A lot of people in the market right now for a new home. Do you have some news for them? Yeah, I, I do have some news. Whether it's good news, uh, that's up for debate, but it seems like mortgage rates uh, drifted slightly higher this week, and this was on the heels of disappointing March inflation numbers. Uh, the 30-year fixed rate mortgage averaged 6.88% in the week ending April 11th, and that's up from 6.82% the previous week, so this is a bit higher now. Uh, a year ago this time, just for context here, uh, the rate was just over six and a quarter. Um, now, average, although rates have stayed steady in recent weeks, uh, higher than expected inflation numbers could move things 
in the wrong direction with persistent uh, uh, price pressures. Economists aren't expecting mortgage rates to fall below 6% at any point this year. So that's something to keep oh, in wow. mind. Yeah, well, they, the Associated Press reports that some economists are expecting those rates to ease just a little bit. So hopefully that's some good news there. Let's look at the big picture. How's the global economy doing? Yeah, uh, so let's uh, take a step back here. Analysts are reporting a negative outlook, uh, and this is specifically in terms of global credit conditions for this year. Uh, so this is based on a new survey by the International Association of Credit Portfolio Managers, and more participants than expected said they think corporate credit defaults will rise in the coming months, and that is not a good thing. Uh, but it is al also dependent on the region, of course. So 51% of, uh, of experts expect to see it pick up in North America. 57 are expecting defaults in Europe. Uh, and those surveyed expect overall credit spreads to widen as well. So, uh, I mean, potentially not good news, but we'll see. Right, but yeah, well, it looks like interest rates are high across the world right now. We're just feeling that, and um, all the more reason why everybody's really anxiously awaiting the first rate cuts, I guess. So, um, what else? So, I think Lyft and Uber have some change of plans that they made. Yeah, that did happen yesterday. So, let me give you a quick update on that. So, the ride-hailing company uh, Uber and Lyft, they're going to delay their planned exit from Minneapolis. Uh, and this is after city officials decided Wednesday uh, to push back the start of a driver pay raise by two months. So some council members say it gives other companies more time to establish themselves in the market before Uber and Lyft potentially leave. Um, it also gives potentially Minnesota lawmakers a chance, uh, you know, to sort of pass statewide rules on pay for ride hailing drivers. Now under the new ordinance, uh, ride hailing companies must pay drivers at least $1.40 per mile and 51 cents per minute, or this is equivalent to about $5 per ride. Yeah, and Lyft says it's threatening to leave just Minneapolis, but Uber could leave the whole Twin Cities area there. Don Ma, host of Entities Business Matters, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay with us. Do you love soccer? The 2026 FIFA World Cup coming to the New York metropolitan area. Our exclusive report revealing the economic impact of arguably sports biggest event at the MetLife Stadium. Stick around. Welcome back. Some great news for soccer or football, as it's called around the world, fans. I'm definitely really excited. Yes, and you're in luck because the sport's biggest event is heading our way. Yeah, that will definitely be a big moment for those avid fans. Yeah, I went out to investigate this, speaking to a regional authority. Check it out. Get excited for the kickoff. The 2026 FIFA World Cup is sprinting to East Rutherford, New Jersey at the MetLife Stadium. The event's going to have a huge impact on the New York, New Jersey area, boosting its economy with the wave of tourists and affecting regional transportation systems that'll have to maneuver like a winger through a crowded defense. I'm going to pass this over to our playmaker, Judy Ross, who's the Senior Director of Operations at the Meadowlands Chamber of Commerce. Oh, overall, it's a $2 billion economic impact for the area. We are very excited to have um, all the international visitors coming for World Cup 26. What can they expect when they get here? Well, we're making plans. We want to welcome everybody with open arms, and we want them to have the most best experience when they get here. Um, we want them to understand that it's not just what's happening at the games. It will be what will be happening in the region as well. Uh, we want them to experience the Meadowlands uh, from beginning to end. That's fascinating. And New York City City Hall says that there's going to be about a million visitors coming, and half of them won't even be ticket holders. Do they have any way to enjoy the game if they're not going? Well, we want to make sure that they do have opportunities. We um, will plan on having watch parties in the area. We know we're going to try to activate some of the local communities to make sure that there are activities for those that don't have tickets. Excellent. Yeah, and the mayor's office also says that this is going to support 14,000 jobs. So it's going to be just a huge impact. What about transportation? Have they made any adjustments? We recently spoke with New Jersey Transit, Kevin Corbett, the president and CEO of New Jersey Transit, and he did assure us they are making many, many changes, additions to routes. Uh, they're looking at their buses and the trains um, and making 
big enhancements to accommodate all the extra visitors that will be here. A big series of games that are going on here, especially the final. What about the hotel industry? Are they going to be the ones that benefit the most from this? Well, I certainly hope so. Uh, not only the hotels, the restaurants, even our attractions. People have downtime. We want them to visit all the attractions in the area. Um, certainly grab a, a great meal in one of our fancy restaurants and, and our casual restaurants as well. Sounds like fun. And Mayor Eric Adams, he says that this is a generation-defining moment. What is the historical significance of having the World Cup come here? Oh, it's, it's so significant for our area. Um, in addition to some of the larger events that we've had, this is going to be uh, 10 times that. You know, it's, it's, we say it's Super Bowl on steroids because it's not just North America, it is the world. So we are going to be welcoming the world. Here's what these New Yorkers have to say. Well, it's going to be a good World Cup. You know, it's hopefully uh, Mexico takes it. In terms of economy, in terms of finances, it will bring like a lot of revenue to this to the to the city or the state. So it's a great idea. I mean, there you know there is going to be expenses and money coming in. It's not like just it's not just only about money coming in because there is also going to cost like police, right? Ima imagine how many uh, police officers we will have to. Uh, get involved in it. So they're going to be pulled off from the streets to kind of support the, the World Cup. That guy is making a good point, but man, it's such a big deal and it's going to host the final game as well. Yeah, I know, it's awesome. And it's the first time that three nations, the United States, U and Canada and Mexico, are going to host the World Cup. Right, big deal, big deal. So yeah, I'm totally, apparently, you know, it's two years to go, so tickets are not really on sale yet, but apparently you can sign up for a newsletter and they'll let you know, and I'm sure you'll have to be really early to get any. Yeah, it's yeah. going around the corner. You know, I played soccer for over five years. Oh. So I was a midfielder. Oh, nice. A lot of running. All right. Yeah, great. Good for that stamina. So are you going to watch? Try to get some tickets? Oh, yeah. Well, and I'm sure we're going to be covering it. So. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's yeah. right around the corner all, from here. see so. all the highlights. <laughs> all right. Uh, we're heading to a quick break, but we'll be right back with more. So stay with us. NTD News, the fastest growing independent news source in America, bringing you breaking news from around the world. Expert analysis, investigative reporting, and original award-winning documentaries. We're known for our uncensored China coverage you won't find anywhere else. We cover the stories that affect you and shape our world without the political noise. We report from the heart with you in mind. Watch us right here on NTD News. Good morning. Welcome to NTD. Good morning here. Today's top stories. Israel says it's on high alert for a possible attack by Iran and why the U.S. issued an immediate order to all government employees in Israel. Former President Trump is trending upward. Based on the latest poll averages, we have expert analysis of what polls may not capture and what to expect come November. The FBI director says it's crunch time with a growing threat of a terrorist attack on U.S. soil. The agency wants a surveillance tool renewed before it expires next week. Twisters, torrential rains and washed out roads. The southeast hit with multiple storms. Video footage of the tempests wreaking havoc. Is there a nationwide shortage of law enforcement? One city in Texas is trying to recruit New York City police officers. We take a look at the details with the retired NYPD homicide detective. Mark your calendars. National Park Week kicks off soon. That means free entry to over 400 national parks. This is NTD Good Morning. Live from our global headquarters, here are Evelyn Lee and Kevin Hogan. Welcome to NTD. Welcome everyone. Today is Friday, April 12th. Today's top news. Israel's military says they are preparing for a possible attack from Iran. After a senior Iranian general and other military leaders were reportedly killed in an airstrike in Syria earlier this month, tensions in the region have been high. Here's more. Israel's military has not claimed responsibility for the deadly strike, but said it is highly prepared for a range of scenarios if Iran retaliates. An attack from Iran's territory will be solid proof of Iran's intention to escalate in the Middle East and stop hiding behind its proxies. 
IDF spokesman Daniel Hagari said Israel has been attacked by Iranian proxies from nearby countries for weeks, most prominently by the Houthis of Yemen and Hezbollah in Lebanon. He said while Israel's defense systems intercept most of these threats, the country is still on high alert. Israel's defense minister Yoav Gallant said that an Iranian attack on Israel would warrant an appropriate response. In a meeting with Gallant, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin assured Israel they could count on full U.S. support to defend against Iranian attacks. Meanwhile, the U.S. said Thursday it had restricted its employees in Israel and their families from personal travel outside big cities. The U.S. Embassy released a security alert citing an abundance of caution, saying government personnel are authorized to travel only between Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, and Beersheba. In an effort to avoid escalation in the region, Secretary of State Antony Blinken on Thursday met with Turkish, Chinese, and Saudi Arabian foreign ministers. The White House, meanwhile, said they were in communication with Iran. We communicated to Iran that the U.S. had no involvement uh, in the strike, as I just mentioned, uh, that happened in Damascus, and we warned Iran not to use uh, this attack as a pretext uh, to escalate further in the region or attack U.S. facilities or pers personnel. At the same time, the White House affirmed the U.S.'s ironclad commitment to Israel's security. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made strong comments about Iranian and other possible threats. He spoke to Israeli troops at an Air Force base on Thursday. And we established a simple principle. Whoever hurts us, we hurt him. On Thursday, the military said Israeli jets hit Hezbollah military targets in the areas of Lebanon. Netanyahu's statements come as Israel pulls its troops out of the Gaza Strip in preparation for an assault on the southern Gaza city of Rafah. FBI Director Christopher Wray is sounding the alarm about the possibility of a terrorist attack in the U.S. He says the FBI's concerns are growing about the threat of a coordinated attack similar to the ISIS attack at a Russian concert hall last month. Ray urged Congress yesterday to reauthorize Section 702 of FISA, or the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Section 702 is set to expire next week. And today's Jeremy Sandberg tells us more. We've seen the threat from foreign terrorists rise to a whole nother level after October 7th. FBI Director Christopher Wray told the House Budget Panel Thursday that it was crunch time with Section 702 of FISA set to expire next week. And I would be hard pressed to think of a time where so many threats to our public safety and national security were so elevated all at once. Ray pressed lawmakers to renew the surveillance program, calling it an indispensable tool to help prevent terror attacks. So let me be clear, failure to reauthorize 702 or gutting it with some new kind of warrant requirement would be dangerous and put Americans' lives at risk. A procedural vote for a bill to renew Section 702 failed in the House Wednesday. 702 allows the government to collect communications of non-Americans outside the country without a warrant, but it also allows the FBI to gather communications of Americans in the process, which has sparked some pushback from lawmakers. House Speaker Mike Johnson called the program critically important. Written testimony by Ray says the FBI had roughly 4,000 international terrorism investigations open at the end of the last fiscal year. The FBI director asked the panel to help get the Bureau's budget back on track after its 2024 budget fell $500 million short. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. The U.S. Cybersecurity Agency says Russian hackers have accessed Microsoft's servers to steal emails between officials and the tech giant. The watchdog put out an emergency directive this week requiring agencies to change any logins that were taken. It also requires them to check into what else might be at risk. The directive warns the hackers were exploiting authentication details shared by email to try and break into Microsoft's customer systems. Multiple government agencies were breached, but CISA did not name which ones. CISA did not describe the extent of any national security risks. It says the hackers might have gone after non-government groups too. Former President Trump said he wants to debate President Biden as soon as possible. Trump called for earlier and more debates in the lead up to November. Trump did not debate his challengers during the GOP primary race, but in recent weeks, he offered to debate Biden, quote, anytime, anywhere, any place. Trump's top campaign advisors Thursday sent a letter to the Commission on Presidential Debates and asked the commission to move up its proposed debates to ensure more Americans have a chance to see the candidates before voting. 
The letter said the first of two debates in 2020 had an anti-Trump moderator and asked for the 2024 debates to be, quote, truly fair and conducted impartially. Biden did not commit to debating Trump, but did not rule it out, saying last month it would depend on the former president's, quote, behavior. Former President Trump is trending upward in election polls. In multi-candidate races in all swing states, he leads President Biden by between two to seven points. And today's Daniel Monahan has more on the latest numbers, plus analysis from a polling expert. Former President Trump's swing state lead is based on January to March poll averages of registered or likely voters listed by 538. When excluding third-party candidates, President Trump stays ahead of his opponent. But experts say there are some factors the polls may not reflect. Trafalgar Group's head pollster Robert Cahaley had the most accurate results, showing a Trump victory in 2016. He says Trump's hidden voters are one such factor. Trump's hidden voters are people who just won't say they're for Trump. Professor David Taylor, director of the Institute for Policy and Opinion Research at Virginia's Roanoke College, says a small lead doesn't always translate into victory. If someone has a 10-point lead, they're likely to win. If someone has a three-point lead, you're cautious. If you have a one-point lead, that's really a tie. Taylor also cautions voters from relying too much on single polls. Taylor says at the end of the day, a poll is just a snapshot of the demographic someone looked at at that point in time. It's the best guess, but, you know, if uh, something happens on the Saturday before the election where that might change people's opinions and votes, no poll is going to be able to capture that unless it starts Saturday or after. Another important factor is voter turnout. Trafalgar Group's Robert Cahaley says Democrats are very good at getting people who really don't care about voting to turn out to vote. On third-party candidates, Cahaley expects Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s candidacy to play a big role in this year's election. On average, Kennedy commands 10 percent of registered or likely voters in swing states. Kennedy is now only officially on the ballot in Utah, but his campaign says it has enough signatures for Hawaii, Idaho, Nevada, New Hampshire, and North Carolina, and is working on qualifying in other states. Cahaley believes that Kennedy has the resources to get on the ballot in most states, a move which could have a dramatic effect on results in November. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. And on to weather, powerful storms sweeping across parts of the U.S. yesterday. More than 65 million people faced the threat of severe weather. This comes just one day after much of the southeast was pummeled by strong winds and tornadoes. A door cam captured the moment a storm hit the town of St. Augustine yesterday, upending plants and lifting garden furniture. There's no crossing this washed out road. Two fierce storms hit Tallahassee, Florida on Wednesday and Thursday. The storms brought down more than 10 inches of rain, prompting flash floods and rescues of stranded people. In Louisiana, a tornado left a trail of destruction. Power lines snapped like twigs, a tangled mess of electric wires, tree branches and debris. The twister ripped roofs off of buildings and left tens of thousands without power. In North Carolina, a home security video captured a possible tornado moving through a neighborhood near Charlotte yesterday. A tree battered by ferocious winds can't hold on any longer. Its branches ripped off in the storm. And by today, the bulk of the storms will have moved off the coast, but parts of New England could see flooding. And coming up, a retired NYPD homicide detective joins us to talk about the nationwide shortage of cops as cities compete to recruit more officers. And a group of high school students is building homes through a unique program. We take a look at the difference they are making for themselves and their community. Good to have you back, everyone. Here's an update on the men and women in blue in the Big Apple. Escape from New York. That's what a congresswoman from Texas is telling NYPD officers to do. She's trying to recruit them to the north of her state for better conditions. Right, and she put an ad in the New York Post telling officers that they're not being supported by radical left politicians and to relocate to enjoy low taxes, 
growth and residents who back the blue. Joining us now to talk about this is Peter Forcelli, a retired NYPD homicide detective and a retired ATF deputy assistant director. That's right. It's so great to have you this morning. Welcome again. Honored to be here. Thanks for having me. Now, I want to start by getting your reaction first. What do you think about, you know, Congresswoman Beth Van Dyne's effort to recruit NYPD officers into another state? Well, it's the first time I've seen a congressperson do it. Um, obviously, she's looking out for her constituents, so I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. But recruiting folks from the NYPD is not something new. Uh, I know that uh, Governor DeSantis had tried to do it some time ago, and I know even from my time with the New York City Police Department, there were times where, like, for example, the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department actively tried to recruit NYPD officers. Um, you want them New for York. a reason. Yeah, well, that, look, it's a very well-trained police department. The academy's six, um, six months long. Um, a focus on police science, social science, physical fitness shooting. And generally, look, police officers that work here in New York see things that aren't commonly seen in other parts of the country. So you're bringing on well-rounded police officers. And the challenge here is that most law enforcement officers in New York City don't feel supported by the mayor. They don't feel supported by the city council. Morale is down. So I think some of them would consider going to someplace where they feel they'd have more support from their elected officials and from the community. So it's a challenge. And on that note, Detective Forcelli, is there any truth to the picture Representative Van Dyne paints of New York's finest being victims of perceived bad policy involving immigration and defunding the police? Absolutely. I mean, when you look at what's happening in New York, and I know there's, there's you know, a narrative that's coming from some of the city's leaders that the city's the safest city in North America. Um, when you see what's happening in the streets, you're, you know, your eyes don't believe what you're hearing coming out of their mouths. And that's what the officers see every day with the crews on the, um, uh, on the scooters, for example, and Trend the Agua, the, uh, the Venezuelan gang now having a presence in New York City. Uh, the officers don't feel like they, they're being supported by their elected officials and, and the court system here. So it's almost like they want to come on this job to do good things, but it's things that are beyond their control that prevent them from doing that. Right, so. and it also sounds like they're needed more than ever now. But, you know, it, as you mentioned, it's not a first. Um, shortage has been an issue, issue in a number of areas. Um, D.C. has tried to do it. Uh, Minneapolis has been trying to hire from Houston. Not necessarily officers, maybe, but, you know, at the same time, there was the feeling that maybe, you know, they could uh, lower the requirements for hiring. What I'm wondering, what do you think is the issue with this, your biggest concern with this kind of police shortage? Well, um, there's, it's actually twofold because there's been recruiting issues in many police departments, but now there's also retention issues where they have officers that have been trained, they paid to train them, who are now leaving. And some of them are leaving the profession. So it's very challenging. And again, it's because police don't feel supported. Um, it's, it's a national problem. But again, like f recruiting in some areas has been a challenge for some time. The retention issue is a kind of new emerging threat. But I remember I took the NYPD test a long time ago with 60,000 people. 60,000 people wanted to be cops back in the mid-80s when I took that test. Now they struggle to get 2,500 people to take that test to become a New York City police officer. It's because of the stigma that's been cast on policing, I would say unjustifiably, by some folks who wanted to defund the police or who demonized the police for making mistakes that very often honest mistakes that are made in a split second that folks then can parse for hours, weeks, months, years to look at in hindsight. So, you know, again, I think most police take the job to do good, um, but it's frightening when you don't know that, you know, doing something that happens by mistake can get you indicted or fired and, you know, you, you lose the ability to feed your family. It's, it's, it's scary. Uh, look, and back in New York, when I started, there was Democrat politicians, Ed Koch was the mayor. There was, a, there was an absolute sense of support for law enforcement. They don't feel that today. Well, wow. and Detective, I will point out here that Mayor Eric Adams, he's saying that the Congresswoman should focus on reducing homicide rates in Texas instead of putting out an ad like this. Are there ethical principles that govern what lawmakers should and should not do regarding recruiting police officers across state lines? I don't necessarily know that there are. And again, I, I found it odd when she when because I did see her make that plea on television. I found it odd that she's from another state, but at the same time, she's she's representing her constituents. Mm -hmm. And if she thinks that she can bring in some of the best police officers from somewhere else, I, I guess in some ways that's her job, right? To look out for her folks. Right. Is it in the best interest of New York City? Certainly not. Um, but look, 
when I worked as a special agent in charge for ATF in Miami, I'd frequently run into former NYPD cops who were working down there. So it's not new for NYPD officers to leave the organization Absolutely. and go to other states. It's not so, a new yeah. phenomenon. We, we, yeah, definitely. We've talked about the problems. Do you have any, um, what, what about issues? How do you think is the best way to solve this? Well, look, I, it, I think until the New York City Council, which is some, one of the biggest problems, starts to show some support for law enforcement, things are going to continue to be bad. I think the mayor, who was a New York City police officer, who had a reputation for bad-mouthing the police department for decades, now he's saying the right things, but it's hard to erase two decades of commentary, you know, by just changing the narrative now. So I think that people really need to come around and show support for the police outwardly. I think a pay raise would be great, but look, cops come on the job not expecting to get rich. It's really not as much about the money as folks think. It's about the support. And I think the community generally supports the police. It's a small group of voices, very loud voices, that don't. And unfortunately, that's what you're hearing. You're hearing the bad. And the cops are hearing the bad. So, you know, but until the elected officials, that includes the district attorneys, um, start to support the police and act in that manner, then I think you're going to continue to see exodus. Right. Thank you so much for weighing in on this. Detective Peter Fricelli, homicide detective, NYPD, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And from the pounding of hammers to the buzz of saws, a group of Utah high school students are building more than just homes. They're also constructing their futures. NTD's Daniel Monhan speaks with a school building trades teacher who runs a unique home building program. Quinn Drury runs a one-of-a-kind home building program at Murray High School in Utah. Eleven houses have been built so far in the program, which launched in 1996, plus a few sheds, garages, and mini houses. Speed is not the name of the game in the program. Drury says students learn how to do it right, or they take it apart and do it over. Locals apparently don't mind paying a little extra for quality. Except for 2008, <laughs> every home we've ever had is sold for above appraised value. Drury says the purpose of the program is to give students real life experiences. I believe every kid's given special talents and abilities, and, and sometimes the traditional school system does not highlight the talents that these kids have. But in the real world, they will be extremely successful with what they've learned and what they can do. The building trades instructor says that the more authentic the experience, the more the students will learn. The best part about the, the, the home building is, is these kids are young. They're usually uh, 10th, 11th, 12th grade students that, I'm, that, we're, that we're, we have. And, and, and they're kind of learning what, what they like the most. And by doing a whole house, they get a, they get a feel of everything. Drury imparts skills he gained from a construction management program at a local college and on job sites before he began teaching 28 years ago. Some of them are going to excel and their talents and abilities will be in framing. Some, um, I've got kids that love the painting. When we started doing the painting, um, we got kids that, um, I've got several kids over the years that have become electricians or plumbers or, or uh, uh, mechanical workers. Some love a little demolition. I got a lot of kids that love the excavation part um, and, and running the big equipment. Drury says he pushes those interested to get a four-year construction management degree. Students in the program get 18 credit hours at a local college and receive a scholarship. Drury says many tradesmen are needed now in America. The former construction manager turned teacher, who once built houses working for his grandpa, says there hasn't been a meaningful push to develop apprentices or professional talent until recently. I have a strong belief in the, the future of America and of these kids, that they, um, they want to work hard, they want to, they want to learn, and, they, they, and when given the opportunity, they can do great things. According to a jobber survey, many students have been taught from a young age that academics are the only way toward a career. Nearly 80% of the jobber survey participants said their parents encouraged them to enroll in college. A mere 5% were guided toward vocational training. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. Well, listen, I think that's a great way. You know, one thing is, of course, tradesmen are, tradesmen are needed, and, but not to mention about all the skills that young people can learn. Yeah, and now is the time, because according to the Associated Builders and Contractors, there's a work shortage of about half a million in the workforce for construction. Right, and we need that. We need that a lot, and also looking at the house prices. But at the same time, let's not talk about prices, you know. The teamwork that 
those kids learn or like the practical social skills, leading skills. And I think, you know, practical um, experience is just so much needed yeah. as a student. And who doesn't like nice houses? We need those quality structures. Yeah, exactly. All right. And on to another story. It's that time of year again. National Park Week kicks off April 20th. To celebrate, entry fees to every national park in the country are waived that day. Special activities are also planned throughout the week. There are close to 430 sites within the national park system, from national battlefields to seaside parks. The event runs from Saturday, April 20th to Sunday, April 28th. The United States has some really great beauty. I mean, I've been to Yellowstone National Park, mm -hmm. Glacier National Park, just awesome scenery out yeah, there. Yeah, that one is still on my list. I, I love it. Yeah, I did a road trip once throughout the U.S., uh, throughout Arizona, Utah, that, California, that area, and it was amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Nothing that you, is comparable in, in Germany, for sure. Death Valley, I haven't been there, but I hear that's really cool. You know, the deserts oh, really do yeah. come to life in the spring. You think they're barren, but there's a lot of flowers and, and the animals. Yeah, right. Gotta be careful. Death Valley, you gotta go. You, ha you really have to head there. It's, it's, you won't, it's definitely worth the trip. Nice. All right, um, we're heading to uh, the end of the show at this point, but be sure to stay tuned for NTD's News Today broadcast at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. And for round the clock original news coverage, visit us at NTD.com or download our NTD app. Thanks for watching. Great weekend. I'm Evelyn Lee. Goodbye. I'm Kevin Hogan.